Welcome to the Myopia Podcast, where we give you the latest myopia research, clinical topics, and industry insights. Make sure to subscribe to stay up to date on all awesome myopia content. And now to our host, a massive myopia manager himself, Dr. David Kading. Hey friends, before we get started on the podcast, I just wanted to bring up that we're doing something called the Myopia Workshop. Our first one is December 6th and 7th at the Hilton Bellevue, which is right outside of Seattle. We're going to be bringing in uh, leading experts around myopia management, uh, Randy Kojima, Pat Caroline, uh, Christina Yi, uh, and and others to talk about myopia management and implementing it into your practice. So many people are telling me, I want to get started on myopia management or we're doing myopia management, but our conversions aren't very high. We want to be looking at how to get your conversions to 90%. How do you talk with parents and kiddos to get them started on myopia management as soon as possible? Check out the myopiaworkshop.com and plan to be with us December 6th and 7th. If you're listening to this after December 6th or 7th, 2024, make sure to stay tuned to the Myopia Workshop uh, website and we'll be directing you towards other workshops in the future. Thanks for joining us. Well, thank you again for joining us for this episode. I'm stoked to be joined by my friend, Randy Kojima. Randy and I go way back to when I was an optometry student and uh, he's been a mentor of mine ever since. Learned so much from him. Uh, If you don't know Randy, he is um, Mr. Topography. He's the king of topography, has taught all over the world about topography. Um, it's good to have you, buddy. Thanks for joining Thank you. us. Thank you. And still learning about topography, by the way. I, I am. I, haven't fi- I, am st- I have not figured it all out. It's, it's one yeah. of those cool tools that yes. you always can learn something else. I mean, That's right. Like everything in practice, yeah. I'm sure. And then they brought the sclera into things, right? I mean, we used to just think we had another cornea. And so now we're expanding that. So I don't think there's too many people in my audience who may not know you, but tell us a little bit about what you're doing now Mm -hmm. and how you spend most of your days. Mm -hmm. Um, At Pacific, it's kind of an exciting time because Pacific University, um, where you graduated from, um, in that we have the opportunity to get to play with some of the newest technology and topography is one of them. There's some uh, incredibly interesting technologies that may be able to build micron accurate lenses. So you can imagine, Dave, what if you never had to diagnostic fit a game? Just empirically order everything, right, yeah. from the topography. So micron accurate ortho K lenses, micron accurate scleral lenses. So that'd be exciting to be moving in, in that direction. Um, some of the other things that we're working on are um, uh, totally topographically designed corneal GPs. So just using all the elevation data from the, the maps and build essentially a glove fit for every eye, not, not adapt a lens like a symmetric lens to a very asymmetric eye. So that's kind of a fun project. We haven't 100% figured it out, but we're, we're getting there. And, and as you know, everything is myopia these days. So one of yeah. our, big, our big things to study is, can we affect the signal, the myopia control signal? Can we measure it in short term? Because you know, another problem in any myopia control research is it's so long term, isn't it? That to prove anything out, you need a year, you need two years to, yeah. to really conclude something. So we've been playing around with how quickly the choroid can, can respond. So I love going to Pacific University. It just, it's a fun place that we're always playing around with new stuff. Yeah. I was uh, down there a couple months ago and hearing some of the uh, recent things and projects that you're working on. It's mm. really exciting and it's mm. awesome to see the uh, research. And the thing I like about Pacific and the research is it tends to be quick mm. and um, they kind of catapult into bigger studies that may be done other places, but mm. the work at Pacific is frontline, clinic based, mm. what is happening in patients, maybe smaller sample sizes, but then mm. that introduces concepts and ideas elsewhere. And I think that's a, an interesting niche that Pacific fits really into. Is, would you say that's Yeah, absolutely. I, th- the only thing I'd add is that it's very design oriented place, right? Contact lens design and, and evolving the way the lens actually fits, uh, the, the way it's constructed. And yeah. that's something the the team has real strength and real curiosity for. Yeah, yeah. 
Well, some of the uh, some of the work you guys recently have talked about, um, you and you and Patrick, uh, was around changing the way we're looking at corneal lenses, mm -hmm. and uh, just some incredible work that you guys have been putting in in there. So I think it's I think it's just awesome. You also have another job that you do once in a while. Uh, tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, I, I work as a clinical advisor to two labs in Canada, two um, RGP labs, and I guess I should say gas perm labs, right? GP, not RGP. Uh, but I also work um, for Medmont Topography in Australia. Yeah, yeah. So let's let's dive a little bit because so many people, I when I talk to them at conferences and so forth, and they've attended your lectures, they they love the the concepts of how you look at a topography and how you teach. And so I just want to grab a little piece of that to share and particularly around uh, myopia management and orthokeratology. Mm. When, when I'm looking at a topography, Randy, um, I just want to put everybody you know, in treatment. And you know, if I'm looking at somebody and trying to decide of soft lenses or ortho-K, you know, what kind of indices should I be paying attention to mm. in my topographer mm. that would indicate great candidate not a good candidate mm. for, let's say, a standard off the rack, you know, lab orthokeratology lens. Not custom design, but just yeah. standard design. What, what kind of things do you look at? Yeah, that's such a good question. I think on the positive side, if we we know from John Mountford's work, the steeper the cornea, the higher the eccentricity, the better the potential. So, if your patient were, let's say, north of 43 diopters and um, of curvature and then eccentricity of greater than 0.5, then that's a pretty good candidate for ortho K. If you were trying to achieve nine diopters, then you'd want both those values to be much higher yeah. you know, toward the extreme. And, and I'm sure everybody knows what eccentricity means, but just describe eccentricity. What, what, what is that E value? That's on everybody's topographer. Everybody shoots it out. Yeah, what does true. that mean? Because people are looking at Ks and they understand 43, but what do you mean by eccentricity? Yeah, the topographers attempt to describe the cornea another way to, to give a more global perspective on the eye shape. And so it is meant to describe the rate of flattening of the eye from center to periphery. As, as you know, the central cornea is generally steeper than the peripheral cornea, right. and so it's describing that rate of flattening. And in, orth, in orthokeratology, what we do is we sphericalize the central cornea. In other words, we take a high eccentricity eye and move it in the direction of a sphere of zero E. Mm -hmm. So if your eccentricity is 0.1 to start, if it's incredibly low, to sphericalize that cornea by five diopters is really tough. If you had a 0.8 eccentricity, then that's an eye that probably can shift by a fair amount of myopia. Is there an eccentricity number that is highly associated with keratoconus? Mm. What, what number does that kind of get at? Yeah, it's a great, great point. It's north of 0.8 is the okay. typical uh, threshold of like, where you would... You check this patient for keratoconus. Yeah. This, this would be suspicious. So that kind of gives everybody an indication of if we think keratoconus is being this really steepening area, flatter at the periphery, obviously, um, but... People who are not at point eight, you know, and are lower than that, the higher they are towards that point eight or even higher, but doesn't care of keratoconus, may have a higher predictive value. We may more likely succeed with orthokeratology yeah, on them. Absolutely. And I a mean, lower number, closer to zero, point one, point two, we may have a harder time being successful. Absolutely. And if you're a point one or two eccentricity on your topography, that might be a false reading. So, yeah. you know, I'm, I'm exaggerating yeah. a fair yeah. amount by saying 0.1, but I'm not sure I've ever seen a 0.1 yes. E-value cornea that wasn't, let's say, a post-refractive surgery or something where the cornea has been irregular forced in some way, into yeah. a sphere or, yeah. yeah, something irregular. Yeah, but okay. But the E-value is, is a good indicator for normal. And um, if, you, if you look at 0.5 as being normal with a large cone topographer if you have an instrument that takes 
has a big cone or takes a small area of capture, you might find the E-values lower. If you're a small cone topographer or your instrument measures a larger surface area, then E-value might be more like 0.65. So it really is instrument dependent on you know what's normal. Yeah, yeah. So we're talking the the capture cone of what you're you're speaking of. Yeah. Okay. Um, anything else that kind of gives us predictive of success with patients? Um, I know tericity comes into play on on you know normal ortho K patients. Um, you know, I, I think you've referred to it as limbus to limbus or central astigmatism. How do you look at a topography with that and how does that move you with different ortho K lenses? Well, man, Dave, I'd love your perspective on this question because I feel personally like we do a, a really poor job with astigmatism. It's less predictive than myopic reduction. And why is that? And sometimes you, you can't describe why did this patient end up with more astigmatism after ortho K rather than us cutting it in half, which we typically do. So if you're, you're fitting a patient with uh, one and a half diopter sill, often you're leaving the patient plano or plus 50 minus 75, something they can manage, but anything higher than that is a problem. So the magnitude of astigmatism is a consideration, right? Yeah. Because if we're gonna cut the sill by 50% and the patient starts with two diopters of corneal and refractive, maybe leaving them plus 50 minus one might be a little on the high side for yeah. them to manage. Yeah. Um, but to your point, topographically, you could look at the, the maps and say, as I look at an axial topography, if the hot meridian, the steep meridian, runs basically from one side of the eye to the other, that's a patient you know it's gonna be harder to move that astigmatism out of the way. Yeah. Because often, those eyes have in the steep axis on a limbus to limbus patient will have a very low E value. Mm -hmm. Maybe it might be 0.2, so you need to move that eye, you need to sphericalize that cornea along the steep axis by even more than what you're doing on the flat and right. you're working with the lower E. So as an example, yeah. what if the patient was minus three, minus 150, axis 180, and you have a limbus to limbus astigmatism with a 0.2 E value on the steep axis, yeah. you have even less eccentricity to sphericalize the cornea yeah. than you do on the flat meridian. So it, it's going to be really tough to So taking to into account the E value and the astigmatism, but also is importantly on the fitting of the lens is that elevation that you're going to be looking in that elevation difference on the elevation map. And yes. we're looking at the micron difference there of a spherical or a traditional ortho K compared to maybe a, a, a toric or a back surface toric design in those arenas. But to your point is if you have even a small amount of astigmatism, but the E value in that steep meridian is lower, it's, it's going to be harder to get a patient to get rid of that cylinder. Yes. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, what is your thought about as you approach ortho K and patients with SIL, do you have an upper limit of where you go, uh, maybe I want to move into another option, another yeah. myopia control option? Well, you know, the myopia control or myopia management options with regards to cylinder are somewhat limited. Um, you know, there are some toric multifocal options that we could go to. Um, and so, you know, I, I personally would still prefer to go into an orthokeratology and have them slightly undercorrected. Mm -hmm. And if they are bothered by it, we can wear glasses when they need to. Mm -hmm. But not, I, I find that a diopter cylinder uncorrected on an ortho K post patient does far better than an uncorrected non ortho K patient um, as far as dealing with it. And I'm not sure refractively why that is, or they just put up with it because now they can see really well they don't have that cylinder mm -hmm. or they don't have the sphere component uh, kicking them in the pants. So, I, I, you know, may, may be wrong on that, but mm -hmm. I, I also know that we're way better on correcting tericity than we used to be. Mm -hmm. um, not that we're solving all of it, but way better than we used to be on correcting that once we go to these back surface type of toric lenses uh, 
Torah not being the right word, but you know, back surfaced. Uh, yeah, you're absolutely lenses. right. I mean, we're doing so much better a job aligning the lens 360 degrees around than we ever did yeah. in the past. And, we, we published you know, a study, um, I think it was here at GSLS, um, where we looked over the last, I don't know, maybe it was 10 years, and how our toric lens utilization has been, and we're now at about 50% of all of our orthokeratology patients are in this toric arena, and there's probably still some that should be that aren't. Um, but I think lab-wise, your lab and other labs that you've consulted with are probably doing a similar and seeing a similar shift in that direction, and it's just because we're fitting better. Yeah, I mean, in 2005, we had very few toric options and we were unaccustomed to using them. So 100% of patients were in a symmetric landing lens yeah. and we've adapted slowly, but we've, we're now, I think, fully invested in yeah. thinking toric when the eye is toric enough to, yeah. Yeah. to need one. You told me something interesting um, a year and a half, two years ago, in that you you ventured across uh, the water and saw some orthokeratology fits in different parts of the world, and you shared with me that they weren't all as pretty as maybe we would think that they should be. Mm -hmm. And then it kind of came up this question is like, are we really helping these patients if mm -hmm. we don't fit their orthoke correctly? Mm -hmm. And I think recent studies have shown us that maybe we're we're helping them better. Tell us a little bit about what you've seen and what some of the research is about, you know, lens decentration and, and you know, that, that blows our minds because we've been working, you and I, for the last 15 years to get that perfect ortho -okay fit. Yeah. And is that the right amount of myopia management, right? We're learning some things there. Share, share yeah. your perspectives on that. Yeah, it, it was interesting to me that practitioners in specific markets, specific countries overseas, they don't look at the post-wear topography. Yeah. They look at, is the eye healthy, you know, behind the slit lamp, and can the patient see? You know, is the vision good? So they were measuring their ortho case success based on those two metrics and not really relying on, is better possible, looking at the topography. You know, there's so much there in the topography to, to tell you, are you centering well? Do you have a big enough treatment? But may, uh, to your point, maybe they were onto something that we weren't, that we were too anal retentive about trying to achieve a, that beautiful textbook bullseye. And numerous studies now are saying pretty clearly that the more decentration you have in ortho -K, the better it is for myopia control. Not good for adults, if for adult sure. ortho -K, but those aberrations are ramped up when we decenter the lens. But those, those aberrations that ramp up when we decenter the lens are super helpful in yeah. myopia control, as yeah. you know, and just sending that blur into the eye is that signal to slow down eye growth. So yeah, and if the kid is seeing well, you know, I, I've, I've had instances where I kind of chuckled in the last, you know, year or so, uh, two years since this data has come out, and I have that patient show up, patient seeing fine, parents happy, I look at the topography and I'm like, gosh, I think I can do better. And then I just have to be like, no, because it's probably better the way it is. Yeah. I just think about my green footprint on the planet of how many thousands or hundreds and, and thousands of patients visits I've had that I shouldn't have had <laughs> over the years, requiring mom to drive the kid back in, designing a new lens, having them come in and over and over and over again. And all the while we were hurting the planet and not as effective with our myopia management. Hey, what do you think of that, that laser term, 20 happy, as yeah. it relates to ortho K and kids? Is, yeah. Is that something that you, that resonates for you? Yeah, I, 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 it really does. And my listeners definitely know that I think the worst thing that we do is, uh, is include vision correction as part of myopia management. Um, getting any type of vision correction along with myopia management is just a plus. It's not the goal. For years, my objective number one was vision correction, and that was definitely before we thought about axial length, um, but my number one objective was vision correction, and once I started realizing that maybe the perfect vision 
may actually lead children to progress faster. Um, and as long as they're happy, it, you know, and, and many of the studies look at success as being 2025 and 2030. The kid is doing well, mom and dad are happy, and, you know, the kid missed a couple letters. You know, I think we need to let them go. Um, but by driving towards more enhanced vision, we should just put them in single vision contact lenses. Our number one objective for these kids who can see to learn, can see to go to school, can see to play the sports that they want to play, is to slow the progression of myopia. We can worry about the enhancing their vision correction when they're 16 and they're driving. But beyond that, I think our real focus should be on functional vision, number two behind myopia management. Yeah. knowing that you are increasing the spherical aberration, the coma, and both of those have been shown to give you better myopia control. The yeah. higher they are, the better the myopia yeah. control. It is. It is. Well, cool, man. Uh, anything that you want to add here before I let you go? <laughs> uh, excited to be at GSLS. How about uh, you? Yeah. Was there anything here at GSLS at this very focused specialty contact lens meeting that that you were particularly interested in? Like for me, it's to see, you know, is there any evolution in the lenses? And um, it, I, I'm not sure that we've reached that myopia control um, point of seeing something new, but in scleral, there's new technology and HOAs and building yeah. lenses by topography. And so yeah. for me, that's yeah. what was kind of exciting. Yeah, I think just you? being, um, you know, number one, two, or three on myopia management meetings that we have in, in the United States, those are certainly things that I'm looking at. Also in the scleral lens arena for irregular corneas, I love seeing those sort of things. But uh, there's always incredible education at this meeting, but I think I probably learn more in the exhibit hall, mm -hmm. talking to friends and colleagues of how mm -hmm. they're doing things and how they're implementing the things that we heard in the lecture hall mm -hmm. into practice. So that's mm -hmm. always my favorite part mm -hmm. of GSLS. Not mm -hmm. that the education isn't good. I hope that's not coming across, but no. it's the takeaway that other people have and how people are implementing it that I get most excited about. Well, let's face it. There's experts from around the world, from every corner of the planet that are mm -hmm. here to share their techniques. And so it, it makes perfect sense that you would find talking to all these colleagues that you've met everywhere that you're picking up lots outside of the CE yeah. portion. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thanks for being on the show, buddy. Always Pleasure. good to have you. And thank you for joining us for this episode of the Myopia Podcast. Make sure to like and subscribe, and we'll see you next time. One, two, three, four. Thank you for tuning in to the Myopia Podcast. If you enjoy our content, please leave a five-star review. And don't forget to subscribe for more great episodes.